first episode of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. Now, seeing as this is the inaugural episode, I thought it'd be best to start with an introduction to who I am and also what to expect from this podcast in the forthcoming weeks. Now, I've worked in the law for about nearly 10 years now, and I absolutely love it. I love reading about the law, finding out more, and discussing it with people, which is what I'm doing here. You can also see me discussing the law on my YouTube channel, which you can check out at youtube.com forward slash Marcus Cleaver. And if you want to get in touch, you can do that through the comments on YouTube, or I'm also on Twitter at Marcus Cleaver. So what's this podcast all about and what can you expect from it? Well, hopefully every week I'm going to cover at least one recent legal case from the United Kingdom. Most of the time that will be a UK Supreme Court case, but occasionally if it is a particularly important case, it might be from the Court of Appeal or possibly one of the other UK courts as well, um, depending what's most important or maybe something that's been in the news that week. That brings me on to the other point. Hopefully there'll also be time in the episodes to discuss some of the main legal stories that have been going on in the news um, during the previous week. Um, I'm really looking forward to starting this podcast, getting into it, hopefully getting some feedback from you guys and hopefully just having really good discussions. There's also something else that I'd like to do in the forthcoming weeks, and that's to do occasional bonus podcasts, which look at some of the older cases that are part of the UK legal system, but are particularly important. So to give you an example, I've hopefully got a recording coming up of Carlyle and Carbolic Smokeball Company, where discuss some of the uh, facts of the case, which probably most of you already know anyway, but trying to take a bit of a different look at it and consider it from a different perspective. And hopefully, if you are a law student, to offer some advice about how to approach the case. So let's get started with this week's case, which if you've seen the title of the podcast episode, you will know is In the Matter of D, a Child, which has the case reference 2016 UKSC 34. And the decision was actually handed down about a month ago on the 22nd of June 2016 before five judges in the Supreme Court. Now, D, the child in the case, was born in 2006, so he's about uh, 10 years old right now, and he was born to Romanian parents, but those parents met in this country um, where they were both working. Now, D was actually born in Romania, but after he was born, the parents moved back to the United Kingdom, and unfortunately in 2007, about a year after D's birth, um, the parents split up. Um, The father eventually moved back to Romania um, on a full-time basis, but he has kept in contact with the child. And from about 2007, he actually um, proceeded with not only divorce, but also custody hearings in Romania. During these proceedings, there was a lot of toing and froing between um, the different legal systems. But eventually the Romanian court came to a decision and said that the boy D should live with his father in Romania. Now, the next step for the father was to get this judgment upheld within the English legal system. And he did that from February 2014. Now, proceedings like these are governed by something called the Brussels II regulation. And in July 2014, so a few months after the Um, father started proceedings in England, a High Court judge refused the father's application on the basis of Article 23B of the Brussels II regulation. Now, Article 23B says that a judgment will not be recognised if it was given except in a case of urgency without the child having been given an opportunity to be heard in violation of fundamental principles of procedure of the member state in which recognition was sought. Basically, what it's saying here is that D himself should have been asked what he wanted to do and wasn't consulted at all. The proceedings were essentially just between the father and the Romanian court system without asking what the boy wanted. And this is an idea that we'll come back to later, not only within the context of the Brussels II regulation, but also um, how important is that within the English legal system as well, and how is that to be recognised? 
Now, after the High Court's decision, things moved pretty quickly. Um, it got appealed to the Court of Appeal, which upheld the High Court's judgment. And then the father tried to go a step further to the Supreme Court. And this is the case that we have before us now. However, the thing to note is that before the Supreme Court could actually make a decision in this case, there was a preliminary question that had to be answered about whether the Supreme Court actually had jurisdiction in the first place to respond to the claim. Now this might seem a little bit odd because obviously the UK Supreme Court is the highest court in the land so why would it not have jurisdiction? And in the judgment this came down to section 40 subsection 6 of the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 and under this subsection appeals to the Supreme Court are subject to provision under any other enactment restricting such an appeal. So basically what we're saying here is that if there is a restriction on appeal to the Supreme Court, then that takes precedence as per section 40 subsection 6. So this applies within the context of the Brussels 2 regulation because with it involving family law and in particular affecting a child's welfare potentially, it's important that appeals and legal cases do not drag on for too long because that can have a negative influence on the child. So the UK has an issued a notification that basically says there will only be one step of appeal. So the cases are heard within the High Court and these can be appealed to the Court of Appeal but won't go any step further on the basis that it's in the interest of the child to have a resolution as quickly as possible. In the end then, this was actually quite a simple decision for the Supreme Court because the Brussels 2 regulation as well as the notification under Article 68 given by the UK as regards the appeal process are directly applicable in UK law and this combined with section 40 subsection 6 of the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 that I've already mentioned means that it was a unanimous judgment given by Lady Hale and the father's appeal was simply struck out. At this point I can probably hear you asking, why have you picked this as your first case to consider, Marcus? A guy has just simply tried to appeal one step too far and has failed miserably in his bid to do so. Well, what caught my eye was an article on familylaw.co.uk by Fiona O'Sullivan. And she points to this idea about the voice of the child in family proceedings. And in particular, she picks up on comments made by the president of the family division, Sir James Munby. And I've actually managed to find the original copy of the lecture that he gave at Swansea University a year previous in June 2015 in the annual lecture of the Wales Observatory on Human Rights of Children and Young People. And the speech was called Unheard Voices, the Involvement of Children and Young People in the Family Justice System, and contains some quite powerful quotes um, from the president, who's very critical of the law in this area, and is wondering why the UK hasn't caught up with other legal systems. So he talks about the too infrequently heard voice of the child within the first line, and later on even goes so far as to say that the child is by and large, completely invisible in court. This isn't just big words from Mumby, though. He actually has some legal arguments to back up what he's saying. So he points to Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that says that the child should be able to express their views in court. He also draws on Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the right to privacy as well as the right to family life as well, to support his arguments. And uh, he also notes that Article 6 is important in this context as well, the right to a fair trial, as well as the duty of public authorities under the Human Rights Act 1998. He also looks at English statute law in the sense of the Children Act 1989 and section 1 right at the very start says that the welfare of the child is the most important aspect in any family law case. So he's drawing on a wide 
range of not only domestic but also international law as well to say that it's not fair that children aren't given a voice within the family justice system they should be heard as much as the arguing and bickering parents should be as well Mumby eventually draws a comparison with the criminal legal system and gives a case example from the Crown Court where a five-year-old gave evidence that eventually led to a conviction. But on the other hand, we have the family legal system where even though the cases are arguably more important because they can potentially affect the child's welfare for the rest of their childhood, the child in those instances is basically, as Mumby says, invisible or ignored or just simply not listened to. Ultimately then this comes back to a question regarding our case of Re-D and was this a missed opportunity? Should the Supreme Court have taken the opportunity in this case to emphasise the importance of the child's voice within the family legal system? Baroness Hale is widely respected as a family law expert and maybe it should have been up to her giving the lead judgment in this case to say about the importance of the child's voice. Well, in my opinion, this possibly was a missed opportunity, but it was most likely a correct decision by the court. It was correct in the sense that providing a strict interpretation of the Brussels II regulation prevented an extended appeal from the father and didn't allow for the case to drag on, which is the entire point of the UK notification under Article 68 anyway. Furthermore, any comments on the child's voice within this context would simply have been obiter as well. Nevertheless, this is not a problem to be ignored. Sir James Munby gave his speech in Swansea in June 2015, but this has long been a problem that has dogged the legal system in this country, and in many respects the UK is playing catch-up with a lot of other more developed countries. There have been efforts within the family justice system to address this by getting children to meet up with judges or to work more closely with local authorities, and perhaps giving them a tour of the court as well well so that they know the way around and they're not intimidated. Changing the layout of the court as well can also make the experience less intimidating for a child. However, what is really needed in this context is either legislation from the government itself or a proper opportunity for the UK Supreme Court to lay down a precedent about the importance of the voice of the child. Mumby in his speech pointed to a range of international law such as the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as well as the European Convention on Human Rights and the Children Act 1989 but all of those provisions are relatively vague and do not specifically deal with the issue at hand. Hopefully in the future the Supreme Court will get a similar case to this in the matter of D but will have more of an opportunity to explore these issues and perhaps press the case further for legislative change or even force through change themselves. Well, that just about wraps us up for episode one of the UK Law Weekly podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly had a lot of fun putting it all together. Please do subscribe via iTunes or whichever podcast app that you use um, to make sure that you get new episodes as soon as they come out. And if you did enjoy it, then also please leave a review on iTunes because it helps the podcast get discovered. I look forward to discussing more case law with you next time. But for now, goodbye and thanks for listening. Bye.